tiny baby in the incubator next to us could not be consoled. Her nurse would just hold her, her and I each rocking the tiniest of infants, hoping that our breath, our heartbeat, the warmth of our bodies, our attempt to meet their needs would be enough for them to grow and flourish now and in the future. The difference between that baby with her tiny whales and my own was that the other baby's mother had a substance use disorder. We shared a back room for a little while, a space reserved for more stable babies. And I had the opportunity to observe the compassion of the nurses as the family prepared for discharge. Not just instructions on how to change a diaper to apply for disability and early intervention, but also where to go for help when things got overwhelming. We all hoped that this baby was the beginning of something new for the family. It's a reminder that, especially in the theological sense, comfort is not merely reassurance. But as Walt Brueggemann puts it, comfort is transformative solidarity, a powerful intervention that creates new possibilities. God's comfort counters both contempt and hopelessness in favor of something expectant, and flourishing. Last week, we read as the exiles had their first glimpse of the ruins of Jerusalem. We held the silence, the fractured timeline, clinging to the hope that this chasm would be mirrored by God's own broken, open heart. It was a long silence. The book of Isaiah has at least two, maybe even three narrators. The first 39 chapters are about the judgment and exile of Judah, the southern kingdom. And then chapters 40 to 55 are about the homecoming from that exile. These sections kind of mirror each other in themes, exile and return, judgment and grace, but between the end of chapter 39 and the beginning of chapter 40, our first verse today, is a span of about 160 years. While Brueggemann notes that during that gap, a whole lot of stuff happens. The collapse of Assyria, who had conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. The rise of Babylon as the new superpower. That's the one who conquered the Assyrians and the southern kingdom of Judah. The death of the good king Josiah and the near anarchy brought about by his royal sons. Most important, however, in that in-between time is the massive destruction of the entire Jerusalem establish, establishment, city, dynasty, temple, and the complete infrastructure of that social and theological entity. So before we read the first word of chapter 40, we have to first remember what was foretold and to remember what had happened and to understand the utter despair of the people, the collapse of a society, and then 160 years of silence. It was just how the Babylonian Empire wanted it, right? This is now a world without Yahweh. So silent. And we know that silence, don't we? Because by all accounts, we live charmed and prosperous lives. For most of us, were we to consult like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we not only have our most basic needs met, but we're safe and secure, loved and welcomed, uh, respected and accepted for who we are. But our value continues to be defined by a particular consumerism that demands our productivity and deprives us of relationship. We are surrounded endlessly by advertisements that confuse our needs and our wants, and that convince us that we ourselves are deficit if we don't have the latest and greatest. 
Never mind those who are trampled underfoot in our own quest for more and better. And if we are in pain, stepped on, pushed aside, devalued as we are, it's our own fault. Because surely there's a vitamin or an exercise regimen or an app that will fix us. Any attempt to exit the system are met with brutal violence. It's just how the emperor wants it. So much noise and confusion, it is as if God is silent. And so we despair. But then there is this. Comfort. Y'all, comfort my people. God speaks to the divine counsel about a policy change. A change, of course, a new story. Not judgment, but grace. Not separation, but return. Not exile, but home. No wagging finger, but instead a comforting embrace. Not lacking, but flourishing. Not pride, but ministry. Not despair, but hope. 160 years of silence, but millennia of hope. Look, empire feeds us a steady diet of consumeristic ideology and then blames us for our stomach ache. But God has the cure. For as, Andy, or as theologian Andy Crouch puts it at the end of the, his book, The Life We're Looking For, there's another story playing itself out in our lives, the story of love. And this story does not decay in the same way as the story of violence. It has extraordinary generative power. The most dramatic turning points in this story generate a capacity for love that can last for millennia. We, humanity, has been long in exile, enslaved in an empire of despair, but we are not without hope. There is, in fact, good news, beloved. And the good news is that God enters into our story not to judge, but to save. Jews and Christians interpret Isaiah's prophecies differently. Imagine that, that scripture can hold more than one idea or more than one theology. But for Christians, it's no small thing that John picks up the words from this particular passage in Isaiah to proclaim the coming of a God whose main mode of operation is solidarity. A God who becomes and lives among the poor, who suffers alongside the suffering. A God who understands all about the boots of the trampling warrior because this God has been trampled by them. And in this is a call for us too. After all, a voice says, cry out. And what shall we cry, beloved, if not alongside the tiny NICU baby and her mama? And what shall we cry, beloved, if not alongside those who have spent more time creating their personal brand than finding the persons who love them no matter what? What shall we cry, beloved, if not at the borders where those in search of comfort are turned away? What shall we cry if not alongside those buried under rubble? What shall we cry if not alongside those hated for their religion, their race, their culture? What shall we cry if not alongside those whose depression drowns out all other voices? What shall we cry, beloved, if not a tender word 